Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, good morning. We are in our last message for the book of Acts. So turn into your Bibles in Acts chapter 28. A little disclaimer, a couple of my scripture slides got confused with, with another sermon in the past. So a few of my slides will not come up when I read scripture because they were, got mixed up with an, an older sermon. Um, but I'm going to read through Acts 28 today and, and teach us. And the title is The Church and Its Mission Continues. There's something called mission drift in the business world. And it's also the title of a really good book for churches as well. And it has to do with when organizations drift from their original purpose and intent for operating. Uh, let me give you an example, not that Five Guys has done this, but imagine if Five Guys decided to say, there are six guys. And they decided to serve tacos on top of burgers. Be weird, right? Or if you go to Five Guys and now you're gonna order a chicken sandwich. What if Chick-fil-A didn't sell just chicken? What if they sold burgers? Would you go there? I should be pretty good, actually. <laughs> so sometimes, like, businesses can get off, and they'll, they'll kind of drift from their original abilities and what they're good at, and you may not be as happy because they're trying to do too much, and so the products are not what they used to be. Are you following me on that? Well, the book of Acts serves as a great test or ruler or standard for us as a church when we read the book of Acts, we can read whether we have drifted or whether we have stayed on track, amen? And I, unfortunately, I have to bring some news to you. Like, unfortunately, churches around the world have drifted from the church of Jesus Christ. We have not been operating the way Jesus intended us to. So that's why I brought the book of Acts to us to help us learn. And let me give you some ideas on that. Um, one, churches have stopped preaching the gospel from their pulpit sometimes. Churches have stopped teaching healings and the spiritual gifts, the gifts of healing and miracles and signs and wonders. They've, they've stopped teaching that. They've stopped teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and people be, uh, being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. They've, they've stopped prophesying for God and interpretation of those prophecies and those words from the Lord. They, they've stopped um, doing evangelistic work and making disciples. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples. And instead, churches have focused on getting everyone to come in here, but never sending the church out there. And um, I'm grateful for attendance. I'm grateful for um, seats being filled in the church. But you know what I love to see? I love to see the body of Christ be sent out and go change their world. Amen. Amen. And so I'm about both of those things, but I want it to be done the right way and I want it to be done through the spirit and being spirit led. Churches have neglected being spirit filled. You know, the Holy Spirit has no room in the service to interrupt or do anything. And yet we're here for God. And so you'll see me at times adjust things and come up at different times. I wasn't supposed to come up after the second song, just so you know. Uh, there's things like that, that that happen here because I want to be spirit led for us so we can encounter God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And that's why earlier uh, in the first service, when I was worshiping, God kept saying, am I worthy of this? Am I worthy of this? And so I brought that before you. We all know that God is worthy of giving our lives. The hard part is actually giving our lives. And so every once in a while, we need to be reminded and motivated. Amen. Amen. So thank God for the book of Acts. It's helped us look at our church, most of all us, because we are the church, and just really examine our lives. If we believe in the things that the Bible's teaching, if we are living the way we should be living. And just like the, uh, the, just like the book of Acts started, the book of Acts ends the same way. We're going to see that today in our reading. So Acts chapter 28 Verse one, I'm gonna stop and say some things here and there as we go through just to teach and help us understand. And then I'll apply with a couple points at the end. Acts 28, uh, if you recall, I have a map for you again. And this time I brought a laser pointer. Yeah. I knew you guys wanted me to have one. 
See this? This is where they, the shipwreck happened around here and then they floated in. If I could just get a little steadier, I could be a surgeon. <laughs> Having a hard time with that. Anyone need surgery? I got gotcha. you. Just kidding. So they're on this island. This is what we're reading. And then eventually after three months on this island, they go all the way up to Rome. It's pretty cool. That's our, that's our scripture for today. That's what we're going to cover. All right. Acts 28 verse one. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy. So they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited long, a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. Well, that changed quickly. <laughs> Murderer. God. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> and that's, this, this is the power of God at work in front of all of them. I do want to highlight this, that Paul just floated into shore and he's already serving. If you read too fast, you miss that. He's helping gather firewood. You think he would be standing by the fire getting warm, but instead he's helping gather more. You know why? There was 276 people on board and God preserved all their lives and saved them. And he's a man of God, so he's serving. And while he's serving, naturally the snakes want to get away from a fire that they threw in and the snake took the, the closest thing it could to get out of the fire and that was his hand. And so he was bit and they thought, you know, they're superstitious. They, they followed a Greek goddess about justice and surely he must have been guilty because he survives this shipwreck and now he's going to die. And so they're like, well, justice is served. He's a goner, but he doesn't die because they don't know who he serves. And actually our scripture talks about that, but I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I want you to know this, that God didn't preserve, God didn't preserve Paul from a voyage and a shipwreck just to die by a snake. And, and there actually is a simple application for us just for a moment. We need to remember this, that faith in Jesus Christ means that we are saved from sin and death. And when things get a little scary and, you know, when people are on their deathbed, their faith can be tested a little bit. So one of the things we do as pastors or as fellow believers is we remind them that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That no matter if you die now before Jesus comes back or you die or you stay alive when Jesus comes back, you will be alive. You will live forever if you believe in Jesus Christ. That is the promise that you and I have in this place. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we may know that death is coming one day. It may happen in our family. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will rise again when Jesus comes back. And we will be resurrected. We have eternal life. That is a promise from the Lord. And he proved it when Jesus rose again three days. And that takes faith. Now let's keep going, verse seven, so I can show you another scripture. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. Some more hospitality. This is a great island. I want to go there right now. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery, or dysentery, sorry, dysentery. We'll go with that. <laughs> Paul went in and prayed for him and laying his hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and they were healed. Wow. As a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. So God is using Paul and Luke and Aristarchus to do a healing ministry. By the way, Luke was a doctor. So he, they think that he may have been doing some like basic you know, health needs as well. But there's no doubt in the Greek original language of this chapter, there was a miracle ministry taking place. All because of prayer in faith for God to do miracles. 
And I just want to make this point real quick here that don't overlook kind acts to people. Don't overlook simple acts of love and kindness and praying for those around you in your life. They go a long way. God loves to answer prayers of faith too. And why not pray for those around us at work every day? Why not pray for those who are serving our tables? Why not pray for those who are checking us out in the lines? Why not ask, how can I pray for you today? And you may not, you know, if you shop at the same place, eat at the same place, obviously work at the same place, eventually you might hear, hey, you remember when you prayed for me? It was answered. And that is a testimony of God. So Jesus said to the disciples in Mark chapter 16, to go back to the snake and and miracles here, Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18, Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the good news or the gospel to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Notice the word believe is mentioned twice. That's how someone is saved. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Notice that. Whoever believes, they will be able to do these signs and wonders. That means you and me. They will cast out demons in my name, not your name, but in Jesus' name. They will speak in new languages or tongues. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. I'm not saying go out and buy a poisonous snake today and test that theory out. Disclaimer, put at the bottom of the screen for everyone online. Here's the next part. And if they drink anything poisonous, do not drink poison. The context of this was if someone was trying to do evil intent to the disciples and try to poison them, God would protect them. And God would protect us. When it's his will, he takes care of us. Whatever is supposed to happen according to his will will take care, will happen. So if someone were trying to do evil against us, God actually protects us and thwarts their plans and stops them. And one day you'll find out how much he did that for you. And then it says, they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. See, churches have drifted from this. Calvary believes this and teaches this. Because why? Because this is Jesus. And Jesus said, go make disciples. And if anyone who believes, and I'm pretty sure we're still supposed to make disciples of Jesus. And I'm pretty sure we still live by faith. So these things must continue. Some people teach cessationism that it ended then. It ceased at this time, after the first century. We believe it continues, so we're continuous, okay? All right, now let's get into verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 11. It was three months after the shipwreck that we said, they were on this island for three months. And it kind of makes you wonder, maybe they were getting treated so well. They're like, you know, stay here a little longer. No, they were trying to get through the winter. So it was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship, with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first step was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we we sailed across to Rehegium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so the following day, we sailed up the coast to Petuli. There, we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. This is how they got to Rome. Their brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. So this is a well-traveled road up to Rome. Um, And others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. Wouldn't you too, after such a long time, to finally see other brothers and sisters in Christ? And when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. So his prison was a private lodging. What does this tell us? This tells us that there was already a church in Rome before he got there. Believers greeted him. Historians believe, biblical historians believe, it's because of Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost, that people left from worshiping in Jerusalem, they went to Rome, and they started a church. This is, this is also true because Paul wrote a church to the, to the people in Rome, or he wrote a letter to the people in Rome before he even got there. And so they're very familiar with him. They may not know everything about him, but out of honor and respect for his life and ministry, his letter, they come to meet him halfway on the journey. 
And he is so blessed, he thanks God and worships God for that. Now, the next few portions of scripture may not be up there, so um, hear me closely here. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. Pause for just a moment. He's talking to Jews that don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. He just tells them straight up where he stands. I believe Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, try to spend three weeks with them to get to know them, try to you know, get close to them so just in case they might kill him or something like that. Instead, he just tells them straight up, he's that bold, he's that brave for God, I worship Jesus. The one that we've been looking for as Jews for millennia, for a thousand years or more, yeah, I believe he's Jesus. He doesn't apologize for it. He's not ashamed of it. He is unashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. All right, verse 21 says, they replied, we have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here. Interesting. He spent years in prison because of these Jews. They never sent official papers to Caesar in Rome to continue their verdict against him. What does that tell you? They know they couldn't get him. They know that he was innocent and that he was gonna win his case. They never tried him in Rome for this. They never brought their accusations to Rome. But there is a reputation of Christianity. This is what it says in verse 22. But we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere by their fellow Jews. So obviously these Jews hear that the way, the movement, the Christians, yeah, no one likes them, okay? And so this is what Paul is about to deal with. Verse 23 says, so a time was set and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. What did he use? He used the law of Moses and the books of the prophets and he spoke to them from morning till evening. We could also infer here that he told them his testimony because he did it every time, everywhere he went, he told them how he was a dedicated Pharisee, a committed Jew who obeyed everything in the law, but even Jesus changed his life. That one that we've been waiting for, he met me on a road and we read about that in Acts chapter nine. So he would tell them his testimony he would tell them of the, the kingdom of Jesus and what Jesus taught, what the Old Testament was saying about Jesus. He would spend all day, in true fashion, Paul loved to preach for a long time. You remember Eutychus who fell asleep in the windowsill, the teenager? No one's up on the thing, right? Okay, good. So, I mean, Paul is preaching all day. Why? Why would he do that? Because he loves them. And he loves God and he wants them to have eternal life. He wants them to know he has found the Messiah. The Messiah has come. The Messiah has found us. He has come to earth to save us, to be our Messiah. He cares about his fellow brothers, his fellow Jews, uh, sisters and brothers. And he wants them to know Jesus. He's burdened for them. So he preaches all day. All right, we continue in verse 24. Some were persuaded by the things he said but others did not believe. True fashion of the Jewish culture at that time. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with, or he left with this final word, or they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right. When he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, long ago, Go and say to this people, this is God speaking through Isaiah to the people of God. When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. And why? And here's why. For the hearts of these people are hardened. They harden their hearts, not God. 
They harden their hearts first and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. God wants to heal them, but they've hardened their hearts. They're looking for a different king. They're looking for a Messiah who will come and rule on earth physically and overthrow Rome, overthrow all other kingdoms and rule over all their kingdoms. They want a physical domain and they don't really understand that they really need to be set free from a spiritual bondage, which is sin a future inheritance, which is death. They don't realize that. And Paul's trying to speak to them and tell them there's a greater need right now than you being set free from the Roman oppression. You are oppressed by sin. You're in bondage and you need to be set free and you can be set free through the power of Jesus Christ. And maybe that's you today. Stuck in something you can't get out of. Well, you need the power of Jesus Christ in your life. You need to believe in him and accept him as your Lord and Savior. He will come in and he will give you freedom. Amen? Amen. 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 So, verse 28 says, so I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles and they will accept it. Oof. Um, that would be a little painful to hear if you were a Jew at this time. In other words, you don't want it? All right, I'll go to the Gentiles. They've been accepting it, and they have. Cornelius' household, we read about him in Acts chapter 10, and many other Gentiles were believing in Jesus. And Paul's saying, look, if you're not gonna hear me, I know of a group of people who are hearing me. Not all, not all Gentiles. Which by the way, anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. So that's, that's us as well. And Gentiles have been receiving and believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ for thousands of years now. Then what happens to Paul next? Let me give you some context to help us. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. So in other words, all the giving, all the, all the offerings from the church, he was able to live off that, as well as anything he earned from working on tents. He was a tent maker. He welcomed all who visited him. This was a home, uh, most likely, and he was chained to a Roman guard. And boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. None of those Jews that denied the word of God or the good news, none of the leaders in this community tried to come against him. Even the Romans had to listen to Paul talk about Jesus all day as they're chained to him. <laughs> you got to love Paul. By the way, the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, because Paul wrote this letter in, uh, while he was in prison here in Rome, Philippians 4, 21 through 22, this is what Paul says, give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus, the brothers who are with me send you their greetings and all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. Hold on a second. What we just read is Caesar's family members gave their life to Jesus Christ. The one who could sentence him to death or set him free, Paul is there for such a time as this to tell them about Jesus so they could be set free, amen? During these two years in prison in Rome, Paul wrote what is commonly called his prison epistles. That's Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. In AD 63, Paul was acquitted. He was declared not guilty and he was released. For the next few years, he continued his missionary endeavors, perhaps going to Spain as he had planned. And during this period of traveling, he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. Paul was again arrested about AD 67, about four years later, and he was taken back to Rome. He wrote 2 Timothy during the second imprisonment at Rome. His imprisonment ended with his martyrdom, dying for his faith, and tradition says he was beheaded 
for teaching about Jesus by Nero. And that's why in 2 Timothy we read, he says, he knows he's gonna die. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And he encourages Timothy to do the same thing. This is how the book of Acts ends. That's it. Just like that, it's over. The reason why, I believe, is because the mission continues today. The church hasn't stopped since. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to give you a couple or a few things to think about before we leave today to inspire and encourage us to continue the mission of the church. Number one, really simple, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and mission of the church in the book of Acts continues today, my friends. Acts 1.8 started like this. The book of Acts started like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is Jesus telling his disciples that the Holy Spirit will come on you to help you be a witness for me and to tell people what I have done for you. And it spread throughout the earth. Did you know Rome was considered the ends of the earth at this time? And now the earth has expanded and more and more people live. We have billions of people on the planet and the need is great in our world. It's why we, we support so many missionaries. It's why we do these outreaches in our community. It's why we exist as a church because the mission continues. God is not done with his church. And just so you know, he's looking at you and he sees that you can be a witness for him. He sees it. He knows he can use you in a powerful way if you give him your life I want to remind us, because there are some ways the church today has drifted from the church we see in that book of Acts. I want to remind us of the purpose and mission of the church. So let me show this to you. The purpose and the mission of the church is to worship God. We're to worship God, not stuff, not people, not things. We are meant to worship God. That's why when we come here together, we at least worship in our singing to remind us of that and to praise God for all he's done for us. We also worship in our serving. We worship in our obedience. The Old Testament talks about how he longs that we obey more than make sacrifices. He wants our obedience more than sacrifice. Okay, and meaning animal sacrifices. The reason why they were having a sacrifice because they weren't obeying. I'd rather you obey than have to keep bringing an animal because you keep sinning. Interesting, right? So we are to worship God with our whole life, not just on Sunday morning. Look, when when I leave here today, I'm still worshiping God. When you leave here today, you are meant to worship and glorify God and make him known. But while you're here, here's some things that can happen. Secondly, we are here to equip the believer to be a disciple maker. And to be honest with you too, we see a lot of salvations here. Primarily, we are here as the body of Christ to be built up, okay, and to go out and reach the lost. Because the lost, listen, the lost is not running here a lot. They're here, but they're not running to a church. Have you noticed? Come on, church, wake up. Have you noticed the lost are not running to churches? They're coming, praise the Lord, but not in droves. You know why? Because a lot of them are lost in their sin and they don't care about God. And so I'm not condemning them. I'm saying they're helpless. They need our help. And so that brings us to the third point of the church to go seek and reach the lost with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus Christ, that he saves us from our sin and gives us everlasting life. And so here's the purpose of Sunday mornings. It's threefold. When we come together here on Sunday mornings, here's here's my goal. My goal is together we praise and worship God. Praise and worship God. 
Number two, we build, we build you up and empower you by the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and one another. Do you know that you can encourage each other today? Just by you worshiping around each other encourages each other, praying for one another. When you serve on a Sunday, you're building up the body of Christ because now a parent gets to sit in a service instead of juggling a couple kids on their arms, they get to sit in service and learn while the kids are being taken care of. And then we also teach them about Jesus in there too. That's not a daycare center. That's a place where we're raising up the next generation. <laughs> Praise God. I love when, uh, I think it was, was it Kennedy who went into the Na uh, NASA and saw the guy who was mopping the floors and he said something about, I'm not a, I'm not a janitor, I'm putting people on the moon. And I, I butchered that but it's a powerful illustration that when we have nursery workers taking care of kids, you're helping people get saved. When you're over here helping with our kids men or helping with youth men uh, during the week, or you're helping holding a door, you're, you're helping park cars so we don't have too many accidents in our parking lot, whatever, or people aren't getting hit by cars or things. You're not just parking cars, you're helping people know Jesus Christ. It's bigger than what you think. You gotta look past the, the thing in front of you and see that when you serve, you're worshiping God and you're helping the body of Christ be built up right now. Security team, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching our backs so we can enjoy in peace. Yeah, thank you. We have an excellent security team. They're keeping an eye on the parking lot right now as we speak and the doors because we live in a fallen world. And I thank God that we have men and women who've stepped up to do that. And why? Because they wanna see he uh, heaven filled and hell emptied. Amen. That's why. So praise the Lord for that. Okay, I gotta keep going, here we go, all right. And lastly, we, we build the believer and then we go make disciples in your world by seeking and saving the lost. You know, Paul never lost sight of the mission and purpose of the church, even chained to a Roman guard he continues to do the work of God. And so that brings me to my, really my last point, but there'll be a few other slides up. Secondly, the word of God and the gospel of Jesus cannot be chained. You can't stop the gospel. Now listen, you yourself could let it stop with you, but if you don't tell people about Jesus, if you don't show the love of Jesus to those in our community and in your family, it's still gonna happen because someone else is gonna obey God, someone else is gonna testify of what God has done. And by the way, God's just gonna keep building his church. If you decide not to, he's gonna keep going, just so you know. Because the gates of hell will not prevail, so it's certain for sure that you're not gonna stop the church from expanding. So you might as well get on board, all right? Well, let's go. And let's tell people about Jesus, amen. I'm motivating you, I'm not trying to condemn you. Second Timothy two, eight through 10. This is what Paul tells his apprentice Timothy, knowing that he's gonna die soon. Always remember that Jesus Christ is a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. I mean, if you have a last word for someone who's your apprentice, you think that he would say something else. But he's saying that because he wants his own apprentice to remember the gospel. Let me read that again. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news that I preach. Jesus is alive. Paul's telling Timothy, no matter what you go through, remember Jesus is alive. He's with you, he's got your back, man. And because I preach this good news, this gospel, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal but the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. Anyone who believes in Jesus is a child of God. Paul, in change, preached the gospel for two years. He wasn't the captive. The Roman guards were his captives. He had a captive audience. He loved it. He made the most of his situation. If I'm gonna be here in this place, I'm gonna make the most of it. 
I'm going to redeem this situation and do something good with it. And you know what? These Roman guards are going to hear me preach to everyone who comes in these doors, and they're most likely going to give their life to Jesus. And guess what? According to records, they did. The Romans were impacted greatly by the testimony of Paul. You may not know this gentleman, this man of God, but Pastor Kuhn was a pastor here for 40 years, my father. When he retired, we found out he actually had kidney failure, stage five kidney failure. So in 2019, we discovered this. It made sense too on some health issues he had. And so it was God's timing that he stepped down and then the church goes through a hiring process. And my father has been in dialysis three times a week, tied down to a machine for three to four hours. And we talk to him sometimes about transplants and all those things. And there's some things that he's not, there's a reason why he can't because of his health, because of some health conditions, pre-existing conditions. So we've been praying for a miracle that God would revive his kidneys and heal them. But my father is going, yeah, but you know what? I'm here for such a time as this. Because, Ryan, if you were to sit in that dialysis center, there's like no hope. It's gloomy, it's depressing, it's sad. People know that this is it. And if they don't do this, they could die. There's no hope, Ryan. So I realized that while God could heal me, I wanna be here right now to bring hope to this place. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Kuhn is making the most of his opportunity. And don't complicate it. Listen, we don't need to, we don't need to overcomplicate it. Every time he goes in there, the same people are there. And what is he doing? He's loving on them, showing kindness, talking about what he's reading the Bible, okay? He, he prays for them and they love him because he brings the light of Jesus and the love of Jesus into that dialysis center. He's not chained. He's not restricted and neither is the gospel, amen? And I, and I had to ask myself the question, why do so many people in this church why have I done this? Why has my dad and my mom done this? Why did Paul do this? Why do they do this? And I, I, have, I believe I figured it out. One, first of all, it's because they know how much God loves them, so they want to love God back. But secondly, the reason why my dad can do that, because he didn't, he didn't just do it when he was a pastor. He does it all the time. When I leave here today... I'm not done being a pastor. I'm not done being a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not done being a disciple. I'm a disciple later today, tonight, and tomorrow. Okay? The reason why my dad's like that, that so many here are like this, is because you've given your life to God, not just given Sundays to God. Is he worthy of your life? Because if he is, you'll give him your all. Amen. Listen, this is a final point. Give your life to love and serve God because he gave it all for us and his mission becomes your mission. You can't take, you can't take Jesus out of my dad. You can't take the mission of Jesus out of my dad. I was at the Eagles game watching them, uh, you know, pretty much win against the commanders. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm offended people, I'm, yeah. It was really hard for me though. I asked my wife, I said, Rachel, do you think I could sit through that game and see 60,000 plus people inside the stadium or outside? Do you think I could go through that and not think about their destiny and where they'll be in the end? I couldn't. I'm sitting there watching people drink way too much. I'm watching men sing songs more than they do in church. I mean, that's proof we can sing. I'm watching this and all I can think of is when Jesus comes back, where will they go? You can't take it out of you when you've given your life to God because it's not about going to church on Sunday morning. It's about giving God your whole life. And this is what happened in the book of Acts. We saw a church that gave their life to God. Why? Because he's worthy. He's worthy because of what he did for you. You are not chained. 
You only let yourself be chained. The gospel wants to just break out of you. Go love someone. Go bring something to someone nearby. And I have tips for you, ready? Okay, here we go. Does someone need a Thanksgiving meal? We have a Thanksgiving, we're, we're helping you do this now, okay? We're, we're teeing you up. We put the golf ball on the tee. All you gotta do is walk up and if you don't, if you're not a good golfer, it's okay, neither am I. I'm more of a landscaper, I just dig the dirt right up. <laughs> I was a football player and soccer players. I just, you know, the finessing is not, just not me. But listen, I mean, we're teeing you up here. If you know someone who's gonna be alone on Thanksgiving, let us bring a hot meal to their house. In fact, why don't you join the, the delivery team and bring it if you're in town, if you're not seeing family. What about Christmas at Calvary? We are, we are presenting a Christmas presentation, a very simple one, a short one. We have animals outside, we have fun things, why? This could be the first time people ever come to a church building. You could invite them to come. It's an introduction to the love of God and they're gonna see the story of Jesus' birth, right? What about joining one of our serve teams during this season? What about helping pack the boxes for Christmas? Get involved in serving, helping the mission go forward. What about share the joy, helping those who can't afford Christmas? These are all opportunities. How about this? Invite someone to church because it's working. And when you invite someone to church, leave a little space next to you for them to sit with you and then maybe save a little money to go out to lunch afterwards and talk and love on them. Let's do these kind of things. The discipleship journey is our curriculum and our teaching of helping learn, people learn how to follow Jesus like a new believer or even a seeker who doesn't believe in Jesus yet. The discipleship journey is something we've created in-house. It begins again in January. We're in it right now. 30 people are in the lobby, around 50 are in here learning how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, how to be a follower of Christ and go out and change the world. We begin again in January. Why not start there learning how you can do everything I just preached about, okay? The, the, the opportunities are endless, amen? All may stand together. The big question is, is he worthy of your life? And here's what's really cool about God. Yes, some of you might need to do this, and this is so important, so I'm, I feel bad to ask you to stand up. As you're getting ready to go, just hear me out as, as much as you possibly can. This is so important. Yes, some of us may need to reorient our lives and cut some things out to give time to God. But God is so cool, he wants you to bring God into what you already do too. So whatever you do, whatever, whoever you are, five days a week for work or wherever you are, bring God into it. How could you do that? Think about that with your business. How could you bring the light of Christ into what you're doing? Do you know how many people are sad and depressed coming to your business? Do you know how many people need hope and love and truth? There's so many. Amen? Amen. Why don't we pray? Lord, today... We give you our lives. And, and, you know, we're not even necessarily crying about it. We may not feel that emotional. We may not feel, you know, the tingles on the back of our neck. But right now we're deciding. We're deciding that we're going to give you our whole life. So that God will be part of your mission. That you won't be able to take, that nothing can take you out of our lives. No circumstance. If we're going through a storm like Paul, physically or metaphorically, God, you are there. You don't leave us, so we're not gonna leave you. We're gonna bring you everywhere we go. I pray, God, that this church would be just like your son is, alive and well. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. So God, I pray that your power rises up in us your spirit life, your Zoe life, as the word says. Lord, we thank you, God. Lord, let it rise up in us and may we go out and show the world who Jesus is. We realize now that we are to take on the church, the mission of the church and take it forward. So Lord, help us do that. God, even when it's inconvenient, it's difficult, it's a lot. God, I pray we would push through and persevere. Your grace is enough. Your grace is sufficient. Where we lack, your grace fills in the gap. And we thank you for that. 
Lord, I pray you would draw anyone here today. Lord, I know someone already said they're ready to rededicate their life today in this service. God, I pray, Lord, that that gentleman will be given his all today. That ladies and gentlemen in this room, young to old, Lord, that we give you our lives. Not just for the salvation from sin and death, but give you our lives to serve you with our freedom, our love, the love you poured into us. Lord, I pray we would give our lives and whatever we do for you. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.